Welcome, welcome, welcome to Impact Church Nova Online. My name is Robert Brooks, and my wife, Mignon, and I, we pastor IC Nova, located in Ashburn, Virginia. And we're so excited to have you tune in on today. We don't believe that you're here by chance or you just accidentally came across this particular page, but we know God has something that he wants to hear, wants you to hear on today, and that is why uh, we are joined together on today. Uh, God is absolutely good. He's good to us, and again, we just thank you and welcome you for tuning in on today. In fact, I want to applaud you uh, for taking this time to stop and hear what the Spirit of God uh, may, uh, is desiring to say, say to you on today. And I know, praise God, your life will never be the same as a result of it. So for all of our first-time guests, all of those who are tuning in for the first time, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, we thank you for tuning in. To all of our IC Nova family, uh, locally here in Ashburn and in the Northern Virginia area, uh, and those who are in other parts of the the world, other parts of the country. We love you. We thank God for you. And we thank the Lord for what he's doing in your life and in your family's lives as well. Uh, because we know, praise God, he is on your side. So again, I trust that everyone's uh, excited about uh, another Sunday morning, another opportunity to sit at the master's feet and hear what, the, hear what God has to say to you, praise the Lord. Uh, so we're going to dive into the word here in just a moment. But I want to give you a few of course, reminders, as always, I want to encourage you to take notes, I want to encourage you to write down these scriptures. You know, God may be speaking to you right now. He'll say something to you within this next 45 minutes here or so, but he'll continue to speak to your heart even long after we've signed off. So I want to encourage you to take some notes, get your pen, your pad, uh, your Bible, electronically, however you're doing it. But make sure you're writing down what God is speaking to you right now so that you can go back over these scriptures even after the fact mutter over them and see how the Lord wants to continue to speak to your heart to be a blessing not only to you uh, but to all those uh, that you will encounter uh, from this day forward so we just thank him for that uh, so we're going to go ahead and bless his name and uh, go before the Lord in prayer I want to ask if you're in a safe place and you're able to do so go ahead and lift uh, lift your hands high towards heaven we do that because we're just surrendering this moment this time to God so father we surrender all to you right now with hands lifted up praise God we thank you for all that you are all that you're doing in our midst. We declare, praise God, that our lives will never be the same as a result of what we hear on today. We trust your word to have free course. We trust you to minister to our hearts, Lord God. I ask, Father, that you increase in me as I decrease in the flesh. It may be all of you and none of me that any man or woman should bear witness to on today. We declare, Father God, that more lives are be being saved. Individuals are coming to the knowledge of the truth as a result of the seed that's being sown into our hearts this this day. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor in advance for all the great things to come as a result of your holy, awesome written word. In the mighty name of Jesus and by his blood, we surrender all and say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Well, I want to have you go with me, if you would, over to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. It's kind of the text scripture we're beginning with here. And uh, one of the things we started out talking about on last week, and I want to encourage you as well, if you didn't get an opportunity to hear last week's message, uh, to go back and do so, I believe it will absolutely uh, bless your socks off uh, as God is speaking to us. And, and we're getting ready to embark upon one of the greatest uh, days uh, there is here in the earth uh, as we get ready to celebrate Resurrection Sunday, because we know that our God is not dead. He is alive. He's risen from the dead. And this is a great time, praise God, for the body of Christ, a great time for Christians, but it's also an opportunity and time for those who don't know God to come into the uh, uh, knowledge of the truth that he is Lord and that there is only one God. In fact, that's what we're talking about today, the one true God. We're going into part two of something we began on last week. And as I stated, I want to encourage you to go back and hear that if you have an opportunity to do so. So here at IC Nova, one of the things that we've talked about and we try to just minister to the hearts of our people, how important it is to know God, to have a relationship with him, because that's the thing that allows us to grow. That's the thing that allows us to prosper. At the end of the day, none of us are perfect. Come on, somebody say amen. I say, I'm not perfect. Yes. Yeah, we're not perfect. But with God on our side, there's nothing that we can't do. And one of the things I believe that is important or paramount for a born again believer to do or for any Christian to do is as you're living your life out loud, living in such a way that you're glorifying God, that you're putting God on open display in a positive way that will, of course, draw men to him. Now, we know the Holy Spirit is the one, according to John chapter 8, 
who reproves the world of sin. He's the one that draws all men uh, to the kingdom. But people are watching you. You are something that's right. You are a, an individual. You are right before their eyes. So as you live and as you move and as you have your being, people are watching that. Now, doesn't um, doesn't or should not put any pressure on us, but it is a reminder for us that we are the hands, the feet, the mouthpiece of God here in the earth. He's given us dominion. We are his ambassadors, his representatives. So how we live our lives truly does matter. So I ask you to go over to Hebrews chapter 13. And uh, I'm going to read verse 8. In fact, I want to have you read verse 8 with me from the New King James Version. You'll see it right there on the screen as well in just a moment. And it says something uh, that's very key. And I, I want us to say this together. We'll do it on the count of three. One, two, three. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Somebody say yesterday, today, and forever. Now, when we think about that, we can just literally, literally say Jesus Christ is the same in the past, the present, and our future. God does not change. You know, he is the one that doesn't have any variableness. There's no shadow of turning with God. He is the Lord our God, and he does not change. And God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I want to remind us of this and get this point of clarity out there right now. There's only one true God. <clears throat> There's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you know, and the three of them are indeed one. Jesus Christ is our Redeemer. And as we head towards, you know, Resurrection Sunday, or as we march throughout the course of the remainder of this year, the one thing that we can never lose sight of is that Christ came to redeem mankind. He came to redeem you, to restore you, to get you back to your proper fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And there is only one God who can do for you in your life the things that nobody else can do. Amen? Now, 1 John says this to us, chapter 5, verse 7, verse uh, uh, 7 here, and it goes, the, the, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, or meaning Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And once again, these three are one. Now, why did you read that particular scripture, Pastor Brooks? Because I wanted to, I wanted to remind you, I wanted to remind everyone that Jesus Christ is just as much God as the Father and the Holy Spirit. And the three are just as much God as the other. Oftentimes we hear, of course, Old Testament, and we hear the Father, and we're as we're going to talk about today, a few of the names of God, the characteristics of God. We talked about last week some of his attributes, but don't get it twisted. There's only one true God, and he is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We call it the Trinity in theological terms, one God or three gods in one multifaceted with a number of different characteristics and a number of different attributes. And there is none like him. Come on, somebody. So the God who's the same yesterday and forever, I wanted to encourage us as we're thinking about our future. And even as you're relating to your present situation, the God who delivered, the God who did redeemed, the God who restored, the God who brought forth breakthrough in years past is the same one who's present in your life right now. And he is the same one who's going to do for you what nobody else can do as you go forward in your future. He is the only one that could be for you what you need him to be. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Now, as we look to endeavor to represent God or be the living epistles that the Bible says we are and represent him as ambassadors to the kingdom of God. Part of that is understanding and knowing who he is, because you know what? I can't really tell you about who he is if I don't know him for myself. And there are a number of people that you're going to come across today and in the future who need to know God. You have something on your life by which God wants them to have, and he may want to get it to them through you, praise God. So let's take a look at another important verse of scripture, Philippians chapter three. Now I shared this on last week, and I think it bears repeating because uh, the apostle Paul gives us his, uh, gives us an important, makes an important statement, shall I say. Uh, Paul understood, you know, how brilliant he was in the natural. 
I know you're brilliant in the natural. I know you've done some amazing things. I know you can pat, your, pat yourself on the back, toot your own horn, because in the natural, you've probably done some extraordinary things. We all know that, glory to God. But you know what? You will have never been able to accomplish what you've accomplished thus far if you didn't have God on your side. Woo. Again, there's only one true God. Now, let's take a look at Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to read to you verse number 10. And the statement Paul makes is something that I think bears repeating and we have to really tap into. Paul says, for my determined purpose is this, that I may know him, that I may become or may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly, and that I may in that same way come to know the power of the power outflowing from his resurrection. Now, the King James Version six says it a little uh, simpler. I read it to you from the Amplified Bible because it really magnifies what this verse is attempting to say to us and what Paul is saying. But I love the part where, where Paul says, it is my determined purpose to come to know him. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to see the exceeding greatness of his power that flows out of him. And you know what? As a result of that happening, Paul came to a place where he knew God for himself. And what I want to minister to you over the course of these next couple of weeks is how important it is for you to know God for yourself. And as you come to know God and grow deeply and intimately with him and you're growing with him and you're growing in him, there's great power that's going to rest mightily upon you. There's great things that you'll be able to do. Your faith will be increased. Glory to God. You'll see things that you've never seen before. Why? Because you've taken this opportunity to draw close to God and build a relationship with him. And I believe as more individuals uh, seek to do that, we can be the change agents in this earth that God has already said we, we are and that we should be. There's a number of things, and you might agree with this, that are happening in our society today. And I believe it's because we've grown to a place where more people are getting further away from God. And the reason they're getting further away from God is because individuals like you and I, some of us have gone left and aren't doing those things that we need to do to show the world that God is real. You know, I was watching a track and field event on uh, this past weekend and uh, or last weekend, as it were, and it just blessed my socks off to see the number of college age students that when they won or the microphone was placed in front of their mouth, they did not hesitate to say God is real. They did not hesitate to say, to glorify God and thank him for placing them on that platform, for giving them that opportunity and the talent to be able to do the things that they were doing. But it just shouldn't be that group. It should be all of us letting the world know that there's one true God. He's full of power, full of grace, full of mercy, filled with absolute love, praise the Lord. And he really wants to have a relationship with them just as we have relationship with him. So we want to build and develop this trust and we want to put that into the lives and we want to showcase, uh, put, uh, we want to, you know, do that in our lives and we want to showcase that to the world on a consistent basis. Now we talked a little bit about God as Jehovah on last week. And I'll give you the verses of scripture or something that we read. We talked about Exodus chapter three. I'm not going to go through all of those for sake of time. I'm actually going to uh, pick up and we'll read Exodus chapter three, verse 14 in just a moment. But we looked at the book of Exodus and many of you know the story of the children of Israel. And we don't have time to go back about how they ended up in, in Egypt how they became slaves and how they were enslaved for more, <clears throat> more than 400 plus years. There's a number of things that transpired to get to that particular place. But we talked about Moses on last week. You know, up until that point, the children of Israel knew God, you know, as the almighty one. Uh, or, you know, they knew him as a creative God. They hadn't come to know him as their redeemer, Jehovah. And we talked a little bit about Jehovah on last week, and we talked about how Jehovah literally means the supreme being, the self-existing God, the true and living God. There's only one of those. 
And we mentioned on last week how you can hear different names, different people talk about God, but there is only one true God, and his name is Jehovah. Now, you'll hear his name in other facets. Um, you know, he can also be described as Yahweh. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But we read chapter or verse number 14 on last week because Moses found himself in a place like some of us may be in or have been in before where he was feeling dejected. He was feeling as if he wasn't worthy to do the things that, you know, God had purposed in his heart. He didn't know if greatness was something that he could aspire to. And we're reminded in this moment as we're reading these particular scriptures and the information about Moses on last week that greatness is still something that God has for you. God is a uh, God of uh, restoration. He is the one who's given us dominion in the earth. He's given you authority here in this earth. He's given you his name, praise God. He's put his stamp of approval on you, and there's still great things to do for you. So on the backside of this mountain, we talked about Mount Sinai, Mount Horror, kind of being one and the same, just different facets of the mountain, mountain and understanding that, you know, when God was speaking to him on the backside of that mountain, he was really saying to him, you know, there's a fresh start in store for you. There's some redemption available for you, and you've known me at as one facet, but now I want you to see that I'm your redeemer and I'll always be the redeeming God in your life and that factor. So he introduces himself. Let's read number, uh, verse number 14. He's, he's, Moses has been told to go to Pharaoh, tell him that your God has sent him. And he says, well, when I get to him, what shall I say? And this is what he tells him in verse number 14. And God said to Moses, tell him I am who I am or the great I am, he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Well, why did I am, I am send him to them? He sent them to be redeemed. He was saying that it's now for you, it's time for you to be free from captivity. It's time for you to live your life out loud, your faith, the redemptive work, and the power that I placed on the inside of you. It's now time to you receive, to receive all the gifts that I told you you would receive in the promised land. It is time for you to get going. But that wasn't just for Moses. That is for you as well. You know why? Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the God of the, of the past. He's the God of the present. And he's the God of the future. Glory to God. And you know what? His name is also Jesus. <laughs> the <laughs> glory to God. So he says this to him. I am Jehovah God. I, he's Elohim. He's the all mighty God. And he's reminding him on that during that time that I'm not done with you. Now, I brought that over to John chapter eight, because remember Jesus had a conversation with the people of the day and they were talking about how great their God was and what he did for Abraham. And Jesus makes a profound statement to them in John chapter eight. And he says to them, most assuredly, I say to you that before Abraham was, I am. Woo! I'm telling you, this stuff is real good. Jesus is inferring or he's reminding them uh, literally that I've been around from the beginning of time. I was there back in Genesis chapter one when God said, let us make man in our likeness and in our image. The us includes me, praise God. Praise God. I'm the same yesterday, I'm the same today, and I'm the same forever. And what I want to remind you of as we're marching through these, ne these next couple of weeks of understanding more of who God is, what he means to our lives so that we can grow our relationship and our trust and our faith with him is we want to continue to cozy up to God. The word of God tells us in the book of James, as we draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to us. What does that mean? You cozy up to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they're going to cozy right up to you. Glory to God, because God wants a relationship with you. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, I've never heard that God loved me like that. You know why? Because you've been hearing about those false gods. And I'm here to remind you today that there's only one true God. His name is Jehovah. He's Elohim. He's the almighty one. He's the living God. He's not dead. He is indeed alive. And you might have even heard his name mentioned as Yahweh. It's one and the same. Glory to God. You may have heard him mentioned as Adonai. It's one and the same. He is Hashim, as they call him. Glory to God in the Kamash and other uh, readings that the the, the uh, Hebrews have shared with us and translated into English. He's the almighty God. 
He's self-existent. He's supreme all by himself. And there is none like him. Now, many of you may not know this, but we mentioned the word Jehovah. But when you study this out, you'll understand that also you'll see Yahweh in certain instances. And the reason being, or you might have even seen Adonai, is because the Jewish people, as you know, as they, they were getting the commandments and they were, of course, taught to have a reverential fear of God, not scaredy cat scared, but to have a reverential fear of God. In that reverential uh, fear and and authentic, authenticity, uh, authenticity of uh, revering God, they also didn't want to say the name of God out loud or to mention or say his name in vain. So they started saying Jehovah so that they wouldn't misinterpret, mess up in any way Yahweh. But he is Yahweh. He is indeed Jehovah. He's the supreme being. He's the almighty God. There's none like him. He is indeed Hashim. Glory to God. But you know what? He's on your side. So today I want to just dive a little deeper into getting to know him. Praise God. The Bible tells us, you know, those who know their God will do great exploits. And you might be thinking, man, I don't know if I can ever attain that level of greatness. And I'm here to remind you today as we uh, marching towards understanding, you know, the resurrection power of Jesus Christ over these last, next few weeks is that God is still with you. God is for you. And he wants to have this deep, intimate relationship with you. I love what Paul said right there when we were reading that. He says, I want to know him deeply and become intimately acquainted with him so that I can perceive and recognize and understand all the wonders of his person. That's what happens when we cozy up with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So let's get to know him just a little bit more. I want to share another name with you. On last week, we talked about some of the attributes of God, some of his characteristics, which, of course, we know are many. But we mentioned how he's omnipresent. We mentioned how he's omniscient. Glory to God. And we talked about, you know, uh, those particular things. But I want to talk to you today about El Elyon. It is indeed another name of God. And it literally means the most high God. Now, when we talk about the most high, you know, sometimes we see the, the term Allah and literally just means the one who's high above or the one who's supreme. He's a supreme God. He's the one who is incomprehensible in power, in dominion and might. There is none like him. That's why he is the most high God. Now, they understood and coined it that way in their language because they recognized that there were so many other false gods out there or people or individuals just as there are today that would ascribe to having God-like properties. But there is only one God. There is only one true deity and he is El Elyon. Now go with me over to Psalm chapter 21. Psalm verse 21 or stanza 21 and we'll look at a particular uh, verse here in just a moment. Verse 7. Now I hope you're getting this. And we're going through this because, again, as we get to know him, we build our trust in him. We begin to not only uh, build our trust in him, but we embrace those same characteristics. It increases our faith because we know who is with us. We know whose we are. Glory to God. You know, I think about, you know, my parents in the natural. And you may be able to relate to this as well. You know, there's a number of things that I know about my parents in the natural but then there's also some things that, you know, having not even spent a certain amount of time or having seen them do, I find myself, uh, those particular characteristics or things come out. Amen. And I think for each and every one of us, it's getting back to that place. It's almost like finding out where your true heritage is and, the, you know, all the things that your family has done in the past that, you know, makes your lineage so great. Well, there's no better lineage than being a child of the Most High God, than being a son and daughter of Jesus Christ. So Psalm 20, uh, 21 says this in verse number seven. He says, for the king's trust in the Lord and through the unfailing love of the Most High, there it is, he will not be shaken. Well, the he that he's talking about right there in that scripture is the king. And the last I checked, each of you under the sound of my voice are kings and queens of the most high God. 
you have heirship and joint heirs and, and, are, and joint heirs to the kingdom through the shed blood and sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. You are just as much a king in this earth and a queen in this earth as anybody else who's received it through some monarchy, glory to God. You are a part of the best kingdom there is. And our stability and our security rest in the Most High God. Our lives are and can be stable because we have our security in El Elyon, the Most High God. He is the one who's incomprehensible in dominion and power and in might. Now, that bared repeating because sometimes we can listen so much to what the world is saying and what's happening in the world and things that have impacted our lives that we can forget who we are. And sometimes you have to remember who you are. You know, <laughs> what was that movie? Uh, I think it was Wakanda. And, you know, there was a scene in the movie and just about the whole world has seen Wakanda and Wakanda forever right now. So you remember the part in the movie where, you know, King T'Challa is, I think he's basically, he's getting, he's getting the smack down placed on him. He's getting his butt whipped. You know, it's not going the way things should be going. And his mother shouts out, show them who you are. Woo! And I'm telling you, when you know who you are and from where you came and whose you are, glory to God, there's a certain uh, uh, swag that comes upon you. There's a certain level of confidence that rises up on the inside of you because you know who you are. You are a child of the most high God of El Elyon himself. You are kings and queens in this earth and this is about placing our trust in who we are. Sometimes we can place too much confidence in our abilities rather than having that confidence reside and that stability rest and that security be in the fact that we're children of the Most High God. I want you to put it all back in perspective because there's going to come a day where your talents or even your, your financial influence or whatever it may be, those things in the natural won't allow you to have and secure the victory that you need to have. But being a son and daughter of God, of El Elyon, the Most High, will bring about the stability and security that you need. God is on your side. And I love what this scripture says right here. Through his unfailing love. God loves you with an everlasting love. He's not willing, glory to God, to let things uh, uh, go asunder. Or you be put in continuous dismay. He says right there, the individual who understands this, we should not be moved because we know that the most high is on our side. Now, I want to take you over to uh, Genesis, the book of Genesis, back to the beginning. And just to show you, uh, now the Bible says that we are again children of Abraham, uh, reminds us of that. We're descendants of Abraham. And, you know, again, I think it all bears understanding and knowing because the same way in the natural, some of us can be on uh, these different sites, Ancestry.com and et cetera, et cetera, trying to find out who we are. We need to know who we are spiritually and the authority that God has blessed us with. So I want to take you back to Abram. His name hasn't been changed yet to Abraham, but his name's Abram. And in Genesis chapter 14, the Bible tells us how uh, Balaam and they believe some other, other uh, nations were again coming against uh, the children of Israel. Now, Abram being uh, already anointed by God, already having an understanding of, you know, the almighty God. He knew God as El Shaddai, but he hadn't come to know him or in, at this particular time as the most high, you know, he had to recognize, okay, not only is the supreme being, but he's Jehovah as well. So we get to this place over in chapter 14 where he's just defeated four armies and History tells us, and the Bible even shows us, that he did this with probably just a little over a uh, hundred men. Now, I don't know about you, but this, it's a very supernatural thing, or it's definitely not normal for any man to go against four armies, let alone one, and it's only about a hundred of them. So let's pick up in verse number 18 of chapter 14. It says, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. I want you to underline that right there. 
It says, and he blessed him and he said, blessed be Abram of God, blessed be Abram of God, most high possessor of heaven and earth. Verse 20, excuse me. And blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tenth of all. Now, up until this particular point, once again, we can see right here that he doesn't understand or have the revelation that he had prior to going up, uh, uh, receiving this particular victory. And he now runs into Melchizedek, who's the Bible tells us is the king of Salem, but he was also the priest of God most high, or we know the most high God. Now, he then finds out or comes to this place of understanding that he is the creator and of heaven and of earth. As the Bible says there, he's the possessor of heaven and earth. Now, what did Abel do as he understood, came, came to understand this? He blessed him. Now, we're reading this because we're talking about we want to get to know him. And I want to show you that there are individuals in the Bible whose lives may be like yours. They weren't always perfect. But as they came into relationship with the living God and became to know and understand, as Paul said, him more deeply and more intimately, praise God, they were able to rise to heights and to places they never thought they'd be. So he's now coming into revelation that the only way we were able to do this is because of the most high God, the one who dominates, glory to God, who's full of dominion, who's full of power, who's full of might. He is the supreme one. And what does Abraham do as a result of his, his great victory? The Bible tells us he gave tithes as an act of his worship. Now, he's honoring the most high God because he realizes that what he has just accomplished doesn't come to pass if he doesn't know and have an understanding of who his God is. He is the creator of all, all heaven and earth. And he's not just the creator of heaven and earth back in, two, uh, back in uh, t uh, 10 AD or 15 AD, you know what, or, 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 or 15 uh, BC. No, he's the God of all ages. He's the God of uh, and possessor of heaven and earth yesterday, today, and forever. And he's still on your side. And you know what this creative God is doing? You know what most high God is doing? The most high God is reminding you today that I'm higher than any doctor's report. I'm higher than any lack or any insufficiency. Cancer can't hold me down. Diabetes can't defeat me. He's reminding you that I'm better than, I'm supreme over any in-law problems. I'm supreme over any marital issues, over any other relationship issues you may have. I'm the one that can bring your sons and your daughters back home, glory to God. I'm supreme over wayward children. I'm supreme over any strife or people that will attempt to come against you, any wicked or any unreasonable man. He's saying, I am the most high God and there is nothing too hard for me. And I'm still on your side. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. David wrote this in Psalm 57 too. He said, I'll cry out to the most high God, to God who performs all things for me. Whatever it is you need, God can perform it. You know, when God comes on the scene and he tells Moses, I want you to tell them that I am sent you or tell them I am that I am. Now, when you study that out, you know, there's the Bible shows us or the Hebrew Bible helps us to understand that what he was literally saying to Moses in that time, and he's saying it to you today. Somebody say, oh, he's talking to me. Somebody say, he's talking to me. And what he's saying to you today, I shall be what you need me to be. Who? See, in the Hebrew Bible, when they translated it to English, it doesn't say I am that I am. It literally says I shall be what I shall be, meaning that whatever you need me to be in the season that you need me to be it in, yesterday, today, and forever, I'm going to be the most high God. I'm going to be the almighty one. I'm going to be the one who's undefeated, glory to God. And no devil in hell can stop what I can do. Now, you know that the enemy wanted to have this power. He wanted to be supreme. Now, we don't have time to go over there, but you can read it for yourself. Check out the book of Isaiah. Check out Ezekiel, and you'll see where... Uh, Satan before he was kicked out of heaven. What did he say? All these things that he wanted to do, he said, I will be like who? The most high God. 
He wanted to be like the most high God. He wanted to be supreme. And you know what God said right there in that moment when they were in heaven before he kicked him out? He says, oh, no, 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 baby. There's only one most high God. And then what did Jesus say? I beheld Satan fall from heaven. Woo. Oh, my goodness. Man, I'm telling you, there's only one true God. His name is Jehovah. He's the, he's the most high God. He's El Elyon. David had been hunted by Saul for almost nine years. Now, I'm bringing this point up because this might be you. There may be something that's been plaguing you for a long time. You might be saying to yourself, Lord, I need this debt to dissipate. You may be saying to yourself, I don't know when the restoration is going to break through. But I also want to say to you, just like David was able to say, he understood I am going to cry out to the most high God because he's the one who performs all things for me. Whatever is needed in the season that you needed, the most high God can and will do it. Will do it. David learned in those nine years that Saul was chasing him, trying to kill him on multiple occasions, on uh, multiple occasions. There's two, two words that you can uh, keep in your uh in your Rolodex, in your vocabulary that you can scream out. And it is simply when you don't know what else to say is, but God, the most high has got your back. He performs and accomplishes all things on your behalf. He vindicates, he prospers, he heals, he blesses. He is the one who brings about salvation for us. He's the one that makes us whole. And just like he was making available and giving them full understanding of a greater facet of him as redeemer, the redeemer ever lives and he's on your side as well. I'm going to read one, one last verse of scripture for you. Go over to, uh, let's see, Psalm 91. He who dwelleth in the secret place of the most high God. What does he say to us? shall abide under the shadow of the almighty. Glory to God. It's something about resting in, dwelling in the presence of the most high God. But you know, we don't do that if we don't know that to do that. We have to know our God and we have to know what's available to us. We not have to know what's our inheritance. We have to know whose we are. God gave his life on a cross so that you can have a relationship with the living God. He is the most high and there is none like him. Let's take a look at one other scripture. Let's, uh, uh, Psalm 46. Now we talked about him being the most high God. I want you to recognize that he's also called Jehovah Saba or Sabaoth. Literally means the Lord of the hosts. Your God, my God. He is the one who's the God of all the armies. He is the one who wages war on your half. He is the one who vindicates. That's why the Bible tells us, vengeance is mine, I'll repay. There's so much that we attempt to do that's not necessary for us to do. There's works that we're attempting to do to, to draw closer to God. God is not a God of works. He's a God of relationships. Now I'm gonna say that again, <laughs> praise the Lord. He's not a God of works. So whoever's been telling you that you got to do this to get in heaven, you got to do that to get in heaven, they're absolutely wrong. And we'll talk about that over the next couple of weeks as well. No, he is a God of relationships. Now I'm sharing this name with you today is because now we're a couple months into the year and some of us need to be reminded that there is a living God who's warring on my behalf. Jehovah Saba, glory to God. He is the one who will wage war against anybody who's attempting to wage war against you, glory to God. He's the one who stands in the gap as the redeeming God to ensure all things as well. He's the one who's saying, I'm walking with you one in spirit. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And whatever needs to be, will be because I am the great I am. Now I want you to take a look at Psalm 46. I hope you're getting something out of this. Somebody say, there's one true God. Yes, and he is on my side. God is on your side. That's why the angels of God say, what is, what is it with man that you're so mindful of them? God is on your side. He came to redeem your life. And it may not look like the full, may not look like, or you may not be bearing witness to the fullness of what the end of the story will be. But I don't want you to know that the end of the story is victory for you. Come on, somebody. Now, Psalm 46 says this in verse number seven, 
the Lord of hosts, talking about Jehovah Saba, is with us. I want you to underline that. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And then it says Selah. Now that word Selah literally means calmly, pause, calmly think about that. Mutter on that. Meditate on that. Think about it long enough till it becomes a reality, not only in your soulish head, but it seeps down into your spirit, man, and it becomes rhema and living in your spirit. He says, the Lord of hosts, the one who is the Lord, the God of the armies, the one who has the ability to wage war on your behalf, he's with you. Now, I wanted to read that because you need to be reminded today, oftentimes we have to be reminded that God is with us. Now, let me give you an example. Now, the last couple of weeks, there's been all these, uh, you, you, uh, what is it, ultimate fighter things like that. You know, some of you are going to the movie to see Creed and, you know, different things like that. Now, one of the things that you can probably bear witness to, or you can agree with as you think about Creed is, you know, not just one time, maybe even a couple times throughout the course of the movie, just like in Rocky, he's going to get knocked out. <laughs> Amen. But there's another thing that you also know that happens in Creed and that happens in Rocky movies and that happens in every movie where, you know, the, uh, with the, uh, with the good guy or the antagonist is that in the end or the protagonist, they always win. <laughs> Amen. They always get up off the canvas, uh, canvas. They always rise to the occasion. You know that there's going to be victory that takes place on their behalf. And I want you to know Jehovah Saba is with you today and victory is yours. If God is for you, once again, who can be against you? That scripture tells us that the God of Jacob is our refuge, which means he's our fortress. He's our defense. He's the one who's there when we really need him to be there. I am said, uh, this is my name forever. Now, when you read in, uh, I believe it's verse 15. Again, we didn't read all of Exodus chapter three, but in verse 15, one of the things he reminds them of is that this will be my name forever. Now, I'm bringing that up to you because once again, that's another key statement. He's saying this back in the Old Testament, but when we go back to the New Testament, we understand that God doesn't change. He said, I am the Lord your God. I change not. There's no variableness to me. There's no shadow of turning. I am who I said I am. And that I am that I said I am shall be what I said I will be. Glory to God. He has not changed. So we need to understand that he's with us. He's still our refuge on today. So I want you to not for one second, one minute, one iota to allow the enemy to tell you that you're alone in whatever it is you're dealing with today. I want you to know that Jehovah Saba, when you, when you cozy up to him, that he's with you, that he's for you. And whatever war, whatever battle, whatever crisis that you might be entangled with right now, you need to know that the Lord is on your side. The one who was right there with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, and Deborah, and every other person you can think of in the Bible, glory to God. He is right here with you on today. He's the only true God. He's the supreme being. There's none like him, glory to God, and he is on your side. I need you to get that. I need you to never forget it. And I need you to pick yourself up off the carpet. Get yourself out of the bed. Stop having the pity party and trust in the living God. Now, you may be saying, well, Pastor Brooks, I, I'm, I'm struggling. That's why we're going over this. To remind you who you are. To remind you who your God is. To remind you that you're victorious regardless of what's taking place right now before them. You glory to God. God is on your side. He just needs you to see it. He just needs you to accept what is already truth. Glory to God. The word of God tells us that the word of God is settled in heaven. Therefore, it is settled here on earth. We just have to now accept it and believe it. Go with me over to 2 Kings. Now, there was another person who was having an issue with their faith or believing and understanding that Jehovah Saba, the God of, uh, of war, the Lord of hosts was on their side. He's on your side. You may remember or recount 
over in 2 Kings chapter 6, a whole lot is going on. And, you know, the Syrian uh, king is waging war against the children of Israel or waging war against God's people. And every time that he comes up with the plan, you know, the, the children of Israel or God's people are able to evade it. He goes to his people and he says, that we must have a, a mole. We must have a stranger in the camp because every time we set up to attack the people of God, somebody always tips them off and we're never to, able to be success, successful at it. And then one of his people comes to him and say, well, there's a prophet in the land of, of the people of God. And he, he, he gets from God whatever the king even speaks in his bedchamber. So he's telling them, there's nobody here who's against you, O king. But what the king had to come to realize and to know is that there's only one true God. Amen? So right now, once again, Jehovah Saba is on the scene. So what happens after that is they find out that the prophet Elijah is taking up residence right there in this place called Dothan. So now he sends individuals to Dothan. Now, you got to know that if the man knew you were attacking them in other places, surely he had to know that you were going to be coming to attack him in Dothan, the place he was residing at that moment, right? Hey Amen. Just come on, somebody. So long story short, over there in 2 Kings chapter 6, he sends more troops. They surround, you know, the prophet Elijah and his servant. And there's a moment where the servant wakes up and he sees all these people surrounding them and are kept about them. Now, remember the Lord of hosts, he's with you. Now I'm reading this to you because I need you to understand that Elijah grew to a place where he had a deep and intimate relationship with God. He understood and knew who his God was. So there was no panic with Elijah. What he says to his servant is what we're going to read as we pick up here in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 16 and 17. And he says in verse 15, And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was, as, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Now I want you to underline that part right there. What shall we do? Verse 16, so he answered, do not fear. And I'm saying that to you today. Don't fear, don't worry, don't be filled with anxiety. Don't be dismayed. Don't get all out of sorts. He says to him, do not fear. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord, verse number, verse six, uh, 17, then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Now the chariots of fire were the, from the angels of God who had now come on the scene, were encamped around about, you know, the servant and Elijah. Now I'm reading that to you right now because he knew what was about to happen. He knew his God was with him. He knew his God was the redeemer. He knew his God was the almighty one, that he was Jehovah Saba, that he would war on his behalf. So Elijah didn't lose any sleep. And he said, Lord, open the servant's eyes so he can see what's surrounding us. And he said, notice there's more to be with us than is with them. And I want to remind you today that there's more that are with you than are with whoever's coming against you. Glory to God. There's no devil in hell that can come against the power of God and Jehovah Saba, the, the Lord of hosts, the one who's waging war on your behalf. Glory to God that can withstand what it is that our God can do. Praise God. So declaring this today, no weapon formed against me will prosper and any tongue that will rise up against me shall be condemned because Jehovah Saba is on my side. He will deliver you. And we need to have the same confidence that Elisha had, that David had as he's sharing this with us in the Psalms, praise God, to know that God is on our side. And when we know him, and the power of his resurrection, 
We don't allow our faith to be doused. We stand tall knowing that God is with us. He's our redeemer and he's for us. I'm gonna close this out. One last scripture. Let me take you over here to 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now we know the story of David and Goliath. We understand, praise God, that there was this uncircumcised Philistine that was coming against God's people. And David said, how can you come against the people of God? You know, you uncircumcised Philistine. He says, I have a covenant. I want to remind you today that you have a covenant with the living God. You have relationship with a living God. And you might be saying, but I don't know him like that. You know what? You got to know that the God in heaven that loves you so much, he's meeting you more than halfway. God will meet you with where you are. He will take his time with you as you're even drawing closer to him. Just imagine you're one of those individuals who you're not running so swiftly. You're not getting it so quickly. And you're thinking, well, he's going to abandon me. No, God is with you. He's, gonna, he's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. But he will also cozy up to where you are so that you can get what you need to get. So David know he knows he has this covenant with the living God. He knows God has already done great things before. He talked about it in, in his past. When you read uh, earlier parts of chapter 17, he said, you know, there's a bear that came against me when I was watching the sheep and I defeated the bear. You know, there was this particular animal that came against us and I was able to defeat them. I know God does great things. I want you to be reminded today that your God does great things. He's the redeemer, glory to God. And there's only one like him. There's no other gods and we don't want to put any others before him. So let's pick up in verse number 45 and we're going to close here. It says, then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin. He says, but I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, Jehovah Saba, the God of the armies of Israel, who you have defiled. He says, this day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands. I want you to know the Lord will deliver whoever or whatever into your hands. <laughs> Praise God. He says, and he says, and I will strike you and take your head from you. Woo, David is talking tall because he knows his God. He says, in this day, I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines, Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth and that the, all the earth will know. He says, everybody's going to know that there's only one God in Israel. He says in verse 47, then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not say with the sword and the spear. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. Now I read that for you because I want you to be reminded that the battle is not yours, it's God's. You may not have the spear, you may not have the weapons, you may not have what you think the right fortitude or the right resources to be, over, be able to overcome, but a supernatural, almighty, supreme God who's on your side has everything you'll ever need to be victorious. That's why he introduced his, himself to them <laughs> yesterday and said, I shall be whatever you need me to be. I am the great I am. I am Jehovah God. I am the most high and there's none like me. Whatever you need me to be today to secure victory, to have you walk in your, your destined and ordained purpose for your life, you better know that I will see it fulfilled and it will come to pass. Whatever the battle you're facing today, you got to know he's with you. Glory to God. Jehovah Saba will deliver you. And sometimes we're fighting too much in the natural with what we think we need to do. Settle your mind, will, and emotions. Let God be God. We're sons and daughters, but sometimes you just got to let daddy fight the fight for you. You know how it is. Sometimes, you know, as we were growing up, you know, certain things could happen at school or this may have happened at this particular place when you were a young person, but you knew your parents would come to the rescue and fight the fight for you that you could not fight. Your heavenly father, the almighty one, Jehovah himself, will fight every battle, secure every victory and do everything for you that's necessary. You have great grace upon your life. Your life is filled with great mercy. Your life is filled with peace that's been multiplied to you through the knowledge of knowing who you are in Christ Jesus. Our God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he is on 
your side. Now go ahead and lift your hands with me and just thank God for the victory in advance. Thank him for the great relationship you have with him. Father, we thank you, hallelujah, that we are yours, that we know you, that we understand the wonders of your ways, that you're continuing to minister to our hearts, to allow us to grow. Thank you, Father, for loving us in our frailties and our insecurities. Thank you, Lord God, for accepting us just as we are. Thank you, Daddy, that we are your sons and daughters and we get to call you Daddy. We bless you, we honor you, we worship you, Lord God, for who you are. And we praise your name for all the great things you do yesterday, today, and even forever. Yes. We thank you, Lord. Now, Father, with hands lifted up once again, we surrender our hearts to you. So I want to encourage everyone under the sound of my vo voice today. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, maybe you've been vacillating back and forth over, is God real? I want to remind you today that God is real and he's loving you as you are where you are right now. I want to remind you today that God sent his only begotten son to die for you so that you could have eternal life. I want to remind you today that the God who seemingly for some people appears to be far apart is right here with you right now. The Bible says, even while we were yet sinners, people who were missing it, God still sent Jesus to die for us. He loves us. So if you don't have a relationship with God, I want to pray for you to come into the revelation that Jesus is Lord. The Bible says that there are three that bear record and they all are one, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that's you simply get in on this prayer with me today. I want you to repeat this after me, or maybe you've gotten away from God. I want you to get in on this prayer, prayer as well. You know, God looks at our hearts. He's not looking at your actions right now. So whatever's going on, I want you to yield your heart, say out of your heart these prayer-filled words with me. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart, come into my life, and change me now. I believe with all my heart, and I'm publicly saying right out of my mouth right now that you are mine and I am yours. I know you died for me, and I know you're alive today. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for redeeming me. Thank you that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And today I believe you are the one true God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I am saved in Jesus' name. Amen. Woo! I submit to you, you're born again right there where you are. You are saved right where you are. God loves you just as you are. If you prayed that prayer of faith for the very first time, I want you to believe with the very depths of your heart that things are better. Things have changed, even if you don't see it with your eye right now. Because the God who's the same yesterday and forever has great things in store for you. Now, if you want additional prayer or you want to talk more about this message, maybe have questions, I want you to dial this number, 571-206-8529, if you have those questions. If you have, if you need to talk further, uh, we're available. Uh, we'll walk this journey out with you because you are a part of the body of Christ. You are our sister, you are our brother, and we want you to know you're not alone. God is always with you. And we're here with you as your brothers and sisters in Christ as well. Now, before we sign off, as always, just like Abram did, when he secured those victories over those four armies, he honored the Most High God. We want to take this opportunity to honor God with our giving today. We want to worship him in that way. If you desire to do so and you want to get in on this, there will be some information on the screen that allows you to do so. No pressure. Trust what the Lord is speaking to your heart. So if that's you, you'll see the text to give information is there. Text IC Nova to 73256. Text to the number 73256, the words IC Nova, and it'll populate a link that allows you to give. We honor God with, the, with our substance and with everything uh, that we receive. We call it the first fruits of our increase, and we know God blesses us as a result of it. Why is this important? Because more men, women, and children have an opportunity to hear the gospel and come into the knowledge of the truth that Jesus is Lord, that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit love them immensely because the gospel is able to go forth. 
So I trust you may have done what the Lord has placed upon your heart. So I want you to pray this prayer of faith with me. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to sow the seed. We declare that more men, women, and children will come into the knowledge of the truth that you are Lord. And we also declare, Father God, as a, as a result of worshiping you and honoring you this way, as we've given, it will come back to us with good measure, pressed down, shaking together, and running over. Shall more come to our household, and shall men give unto us. We thank you that we're blessed to be a blessing. And we declare, Father, we're free from lack. There's no insufficiency in our lives that we have been redeemed. Our lives have been restored. We are secure in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We declare the ministry spirits, the angels of God are going forward to prosper your seed, that it comes back to you in greater measure in the name of Jesus. Well, I hope you're continuing to recognize that there's only one real God, one true God. And I encourage you to join us back here on next week as we dive deeper into who our God is. Because again, as we know our God, it postures us to do great exploits, to be the epistles, the walking, living representatives that God wants us to be in the earth so that he can uh, bless all those through us that he also wants to bless as well. So go ahead and lift one hand high towards heaven with me as we sign off with a benediction as we thank the Lord. Father, we thank you for this time. We ask that as we go forward, you continue to bless us, continue to keep us, make your glory to shine upon us and within our past. We declare great graces upon our lives. There's nothing missing. There's nothing broken. And the blood of Jesus will protect us from danger seen and unseen. We abide under the shadow of Almighty God and nothing will by any means hurt us. Our destiny and purpose is fulfilled in you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We love you here at IC Nova. Pastor Mignon and I can't wait to hug your neck. In fact, in a few weeks here, we're going to be doing a live service. We'll give you more information, uh, information about that soon in person in just a few weeks here. Uh, we'll absolutely bless your socks off, and we want to encourage you to join us. Uh, so you'll see that information. It'll be forthcoming on our website. So join us back here again at Impact Nova, where we know family truly matters, and you matter to us. God bless you. Again, Pastor Mignon and I love you to life. See you all next week.